morning, everyone, and a happy Christmas to you. <laughs> okay, quiet. <laughs> Luke chapter 2 I'm reading from, and I'm reading it about um, a man who was in the temple. His name was Simeon. I'm reading from verse 25. This may be a little bit different to what's on the screen here because um, this is an updated version of the NIV. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marvelled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Jane, for, for reading that for us so wonderfully. I'm going to pray um, as we come to God's Word. Father, we give you thanks for your grace and your mercy to us. Lord, I pray as we come to baby Jesus that we will that we'll come to comprehend and grasp and know that he is the only place where we can find contentment, to find true contentment and true peace. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we got a, or Al got a FaceTime phone call from a friend who's been living in Europe. She's been living in Europe for a couple of years now, and she was just FaceTiming Ali just to say, I'm packing my bags, I'm getting ready to come back to Australia. Our friend was feeling weary, she was feeling tired. It had been a long time, of course, because COVID in Europe has been really huge, as it's been huge here. And she was just getting ready, excited, because somehow she's able to find and pay for a flight back from Europe to Australia where she could spend Christmas and be refreshed with her family and her friends. The next day, uh, we, get a, we get another message, I think it was a message on a video or something like that, just telling us that she went to the airport and to catch a plane back to Australia you have to take a COVID test and in, in Europe you've got to pay for the COVID test and she took a test and they don't let you on the plane unless you've taken a test and it's negative. But her message said she was positive. She got a test, just about to hop on a plane. She's wearied and tired, ready to come home, and the test comes back positive. And so she's got to go back to her house that she was living in and isolate. No time for Christmas with her friends and family. But not only that, but all the people that were living with her, who had made plans to go away for Christmas, had to stay at home, to isolate. And, and as, I, as I hear that story, and you hear her, you can feel her weariness and her tiredness, I actually feel wearied and tired myself this year. We're human beings, aren't we? We, we feel 
that weariness and that tiredness. Maybe you're feeling it after a year like this. Some of you may be feeling energised and exciting. That could be you. And I imagine others, though, it's been a long year, and harvest, there's other, lots of variety of things going on with COVID as well, and lockdowns, and whether, you know, no sport for the kids, lockdown in your house. For some of you, you've been locked down for a short period. For others, you've been locked down for months and months. And I'd imagine that there is a sense of weariness and tiredness today. Waiting, waiting for a morning to dawn with hope and expectation. Waiting for for a new day or a new year where your lot, lot in life might change. I'm actually glad this year's nearly over. It's going to be good. But I wonder if it's going to be different next year. Or if, if only I could change my circumstances, life will be grand. I wonder, do you ever think to yourself, if only this would change, then I'd have peace. If only I could change the situation of 2021 and have a new year, I will be content in life. But I I think changing our circumstances still doesn't make us content. It it still doesn't lead to being content and at peace. Maybe for you, you were were holding out for restrictions to ease. And one of the ways that you cope with this was you, you watched endless hours on Netflix, thank goodness for Netflix during COVID. Or you rent, spent endless hours of reading books. Maybe you, you cope by just going, this ain't real, it's not that bad. Others of you might have coped by going, this is really, really bad, the whole world is falling down around me. We all cope in different ways. And you, and you hope that next year will feel better. If I could just hold out for two more months and for my circumstances to change and then I'll be happy. But I think changing our circumstances still doesn't bring contentment and peace. Why? Why do I think this? Because I think in a way as we try to change our circumstances, what we're doing often is we are banking our happiness, our contentment and our peace on everyone else around us. We'll go, here's my dream picture. I don't know whether you do this. It's good to dream. It's good to get excited about the next month, the next 60 months, the next year, 20 years. It's good to dream, isn't it? But often we can have this picture in our mind of going, this is what I want for the next year. And we go, I want that. And so what we do is we then lay that picture on others. We may lay it on our kids. We may lay it on our parents. We, we may lay it on our job and our house and our pool and our, and our, and our car. I, I wonder if we have this dream and this beautiful picture of the ideal future for us, that if only we have that, I'd be happy. And I wonder, do we sometimes cut it out like a jigsaw puzzle? We put it into 50 pieces and we give two pieces to someone and three pieces to them and and, and, and for us to be content and peace, what do we have to do? We've got to get all those pieces that come back and we have a complete puzzle. But what happens? People, things and situations we can't control and secondly, they do let us down, don't they? They let us down. And all of a sudden, everything that we've hedged our bets on for peace and contentment are gone. All of, all of a sudden, everything that we thought was going to bring peace and, and contentment, it's now disappeared. And, and I think 2020 has exposed that a little bit for that reality for many of us. That, that reality that we've, we've feared death, we've feared uncertainty, we've feared kids with no sport, we've feared job security or paying a mortgage, we may have feared homeschooling, or their overall marks. And what happens as you fear? It wears you down, it tires you out, it makes you feel exhausted. And and it leaves, I think, all of us with a sense of unrest and peace, and maybe even leaves you envious or dissatisfied. And as I talk about that, I I think we realise there is a problem. A real problem that you and me cannot fix in our own efforts and in our own strain. But I think today on Christmas Day, there is true contentment and peace that can be found. 
See, amidst the, the darkness of, a, of this wearied world, there is good news this Christmas for this world. And that good news is the birth of Jesus, where there is contentment and peace that can only be truly found in Him. There is true contentment and peace despite our circumstances. See, God's answer to you today isn't try harder. God's answer to you today isn't change your circumstances and then come to me. God's Answer isn't, you need to now earn and do more and work harder. That's not his answer. But his answer is the gift, a gift, the gift of Jesus, his son. I I wonder how many people this Christmas thought that the answer was, just hold out to Christmas, restrictions will ease, we'll have 20 or 30 people sitting around the kitchen table sharing lunch together and I'll be at peace. Now, for some of us here today, we're going to be able to do that. But how many people in Sydney can't? Holding out, hoping that circumstances would change. But there is hope, there is peace, there is contentment. And and in this Bible passage that Jane read to us today, we, we hear of this man called Simeon, a man who's been waiting patiently And we see that in verse 25. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem, his name was Simeon, he was righteous, he was devout, and he was waiting for the constellation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. What's constellation mean? Constellation is just to console. It's to comfort. He's waiting for comfort. Israel's waiting to be comforted, to console. Now, When my five-year-old stubs his big toe, what do I do? I console him, I comfort him. When the the brothers, they knock their heads on each other and they're in tears, what do I do? I comfort them and I console them. Why? Because they're hurt, they're afraid, they're unsure and something's gone wrong. And, And here we see Simeon, he's waiting for this comfort to come. See, the nation of Israel, God's people in the Old Testament, they're, they're, they've been waiting. They're, they're, they've, they're, they're living under Roman rule, where they don't want to be. They have injustice that's being served. But not only that, they've actually rebelled against God. They've said to God, we don't really want you. And yet they're feeling wearied and tired of the injustice that's being served. And so Simeon, he knows of this comfort that was spoken about 700 years prior to Simeon. 700 years prior to the birth of Jesus, Isaiah speaks of a day of comfort, comfort, comfort in Isaiah 40. In the same passage, it it, it talks about there'll be one in the wilderness who will cry out. And here, he's waiting for that. He's waiting for that day to come. And so what has happened, Mary and Joseph, of course, we've read that Mary and Joseph, baby Jesus has been born. And so Mary and Joseph, they, they head up. They, they go to Jerusalem, they, they head as is custom and the right thing to do. They go to present Jesus to God and they go into the temple court and, and they're wandering around. Now, the temple court's not exactly a quiet place. It's probably a bit like shopping at Westfields on Christmas Eve or here in Forbes. It's, 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 there's lots going on. And here's baby Jesus and here's Mary and Joseph and no one's really, what's going on? No one's really knowing what's going on. But Simeon, who's moved by the Holy Spirit, what does he do? He he goes over and he grabs this baby and he, he holds this baby in his arms. He grabs the baby and he praises God. He praises God in verse 28. He takes Jesus in his arms and he praises God and he says this. He says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised. So God promised this. And what he says next is, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. Now, you may be dismissed in peace. Now, that's not like just sort of like a peace out, go and sing around the campfire, kumbaya, or sit around and have peace over your Christmas meal today. That's not the peace he's talking about. He's actually saying, you can bury me six foot under right now. He says, I'm at peace to die. I've seen this baby, I've held this baby, I can die. Simeon's saying, I, I am willing and I, am, I can die right now. 
See, do you notice that Simeon's circumstances haven't changed? He's just seen baby Jesus. But seeing baby Jesus, he could now die in peace. Now, you've probably, you've heard of the idea of the bucket list. You know, you have a bucket list of the 10 things you want to do before you die. And so this week I came up with one. And so I thought, here's my bucket list. You know, one of them is go to the Catherine Gorge and the Kimberley. It'd be great to do that. Um, the sec- I actually haven't shared this bucket list with my wife yet, so she's going to be quite shocked. But here's my bucket list. That's, that's one. I'll go to the Catherine Gorge. The second one is do the Kokoda Trail. I'd like to do that. That'd be cool. And the third one is go and ski the slopes of Switzerland. That was three things I quickly came up with. Well, that'd be great, right? Now, unless you're, maybe, unless you're an 85-year-old granny, I don't know, but, but on my bucket list isn't holding a baby in my arms, is it? You know, it's like, that's not the last thing I want to do and then go, I'm ready to die. Maybe you do. They're lovely, but it's not on my bucket list to go, oh, I've seen a baby, I can now die. So why was Simeon so willing to die now, even though his circumstances hadn't changed, the emperor of Rome was still on his throne, Israel were in a mess, there was injustice served, why was he so content? Why such a profound moment of why Simeon could just go, I'm at peace to die? Well, that's the good news of Christmas. That's the good news of Christmas. Because he's seen two things. There's two reasons here. It's a gospel. The good news of Jesus. There's two reasons. He says he has seen God's salvation and secondly, he has seen God himself, a revelation. See, he's seen God's salvation, he says. For my eyes have seen your salvation. To say Jesus is salvation actually means we need saving, right? Now, if someone's cutting 50 laps at the Olympic pool, you ain't going to throw a life ring out to them, are you? Because they're not drowning. But if someone is drowning, you throw out a life ring because they need saving. And so here, and it's actually telling us that all of us actually need saving. And what do we need saving from? Actually, we need saving from ourselves. We need saving from us. We've, we've rebelled at sin. We've rebelled against God. We've said to God, yes, you, you've told us that this is what is good. This is what is holy. This is what is righteous. But you know what? I actually think I, I know better than you. And so I'll, I'll live my way. That's what sin is. And see, what Israel thought they needed was a, a, a wonderful king. They thought they needed to be, have a, a wonderful king on the throne for them so that they could rule the world, have wonderful houses and pools and, and live, prosperity, live prosperous lives. But thank goodness God knows better, doesn't he? <laughs> he knows there's actually a greater problem, and that's the problem of sin. And God's plan is Jesus, the promised Jesus, from a poor family who could only bring pigeons to the temple. But it's also a, God, it's, it's a work of God. You just see it's God's salvation. See, Christmas reminds us that because it's God's salvation, we don't have to go out next year and try harder. We don't have to go out next year and, and do more to try and be right with God. But Simeon is seeing God's salvation. It is of God and from God. It's sufficient. It is fully sufficient. Christ is all you, you need. See, Jesus plus nothing equals contentment and peace. God has a solution and Simeon is amazed by that. Now, there's this, this bloke called Paul in the Bible. He, he, he wrote most of the New Testament. Now, Paul was a religious nut he was well behaved. He did lot. Well, he wasn't actually that well behaved, but he thought he was well behaved. He was so religious, so pious. He's he's the kind of kid probably that would have got ninety nine point nine on his is it ATAR at HSC. He's that kind of bloke. Done so well, educated, done so many things so well in this world, and yet we read that that Paul says, "I consider all that garbage." He, he meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. He sees Jesus and everything he's ever done in his life is worth nothing to me. He says, to live is Christ and to die is gain. He says, whether I'm in prison tomorrow or next year, I'm alive. Whether I'm not out of prison, I'm running around the Malta Islands, I'm alive. Like, he says, it doesn't matter what my circumstances, if I die tomorrow or I live tomorrow, I am content and at peace because of Christ. 
But not only has Simeon seen God's salvation, he's seen God himself. He's seen a revelation. See, Jesus, he, he breaks through the darkest night. He, he breaks through the thickest darkness and he, and he fills the earth with light. Why did Simeon have a profound sense of peace? Because he's holding the Prince of Peace in his hands. That was promised. The hope of the world was in the hands of Simeon. That's profound, isn't it? To think that a baby in his hand, that light shone into this utter chaotic darkness, into our mess, that that God himself would empty himself so that we could come empty to him. And Simeon held God in his hands. God who descended to us because we could never ascend to him. The God who spoke all, the crea- or spoke all creation into existence. And in this moment, Simeon is holding God in his hands. It's, it's wow. And 30 years later, this Jesus, he, he, the Son of God, he grows up, doesn't he? We have a, we have a bigger picture than Simeon. We, we've seen that Christ grew, grew up and he lived a life that we could not live. And he went to a cross. The one who could calm the seas, the one who could feed 5,000, the one who could heal the blind, raise people from the dead. But he went to a cross so that God's punishment would be put on him. The punishment that actually you and me really deserve. The payment that we should have paid, he has paid. But not only was he buried, but on the third day Christ was raised from the grave. That is hope in our chaotic mess. Why could Simeon die in peace? It wasn't because he'd ticked off his bucket list or that his circumstances had changed. It wasn't because life was getting better, but because he actually held Jesus in his hands. And so whether you are here this Christmas where you want to be, or whether you are actually where you weren't meant to be and you just hoped you were somewhere else. In the midst of our weariness and our tiredness, we can rejoice that a Saviour has been born, that there is contentment and peace for those who trust in Christ despite their circumstances. Jesus who grew up, who knew what it was to be wearied and tired. He knew what it was to face the pain and the suffering and to know what you've been through. He's lived that. Therefore, he can sympathize with us. And so Jesus, prior to going to the cross, he he says to his disciples, he says, come to me, all who are wearied and heavy laden. Jesus says, come to me, all who are wearied and heavy laden. And what does he say? I said, I'll give you rest. Beautiful rest. He's he's not going to say, I'm going to change your circumstances today, but he will give you rest. Do you notice that Jesus doesn't say, go out and try harder? He doesn't say to us, go out and earn your salvation. He doesn't say, go out and change your circumstances and your situations today and then come to me. He just says, come to me as you are. The God who descended says, come and find rest. And ultimately in him, we can find eternal rest, hope and joy. Come. Come today, come to to Jesus and find rest. And why don't we sing about that? See, Simeon, he praised God. And so what we're going to do, we're going to praise God now. So let's stand and we're going to sing. We're going to sing a couple of songs to close our time this morning to remind us that we can come. Come, come those who are wearied and heavy laden. And we can rejoice, even though our circumstances may not change even though the things around us aren't getting any better, but we know in Jesus we can find hope.